Okay, so I'm going to try and do this in under an hour, and I think this is going to be uh, a real challenge. I, so don't start the clock just yet. I, uh, I once saw a lecture by Victor Papanek, it's a name from the past, who was an uh, amazing industrial designer, who showed up with two carousels of 160 slides in each and proceeded to tell us he was going to give a lecture in one hour, and no one said it was possible. And he did it, and it was one of the most remarkable lectures I've ever seen. So I'm going to go very, very fast. I'm going to show a lot of slides. I'm not going to try and dwell on anything. And if, if I start to slow down, Don, you just say, to what my family says, land the plane, Peter, land the plane. <laughs> so <clears throat> our practice has a principal preoccupation with housing, and it always has. I've always had a fascination with housing because I think housing makes cities. And what I want to talk about tonight is the transformation that's going on in Toronto that is really being generated by the housing market. <clears throat> housing was a fundamental preoccupation of the modern movement in architecture, and sometime, I don't know when, after the Second World War and the suburbanization of, of North America, housing lost its cachet. And if you ask today any design architect worth its salt, would he rather do a housing project or a museum project, I think you know what the answer would be. <clears throat> but housing is really, really important. It is the fabric of our cities. And Toronto, and the topic of this uh, uh, lecture, <clears throat> is undergoing an extraordinary transformation, almost at the scale that, that I think New York went through uh, between the wars, in which there is a massive amount of intensification occurring, a lot of it really, really horrible architecturally, but uh, it's happening nonetheless. <clears throat> It starts with, and most people don't understand this, um, probably the bravest political planning initiative in the history of this province, the Places to Grow program in 2005, which because Toronto had no natural geographic limit to its expansion other than Lake Ontario, it was uh, doomed to uh, sprawl all the way up to Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe. And the provincial government brought in this green belt that essentially froze development <clears throat> north of that or south of that line and created a concept of growth centers, Toronto being the principal growth center. And it said that uh, in the next 25 years in the life of this plan, Ontario would grow by three and a half million people and Toronto would grow by at least a million people. So what we're starting to see is um, what would have continued to occur out in the suburbs is massive number of houses being forced into primarily the center of Toronto. And this is a very, very significant, significant event. And yet, the city of Toronto passed and was, because cities in Ontario are a creation and a creature of the province, um, it was uh, forced, compelled to change its official plan to permit intensification policies but it did not change its zoning bylaws. So every single project that we do in Toronto goes by a site-specific rezoning, which is a very arduous process. Uh, it, it results in <clears throat> four or five or six public meetings, a lot of uh, debate and angst and fear amongst the constituency of Toronto. And what's maddening is that there is no leadership, there's no big idea about what is going on, and we have a planning department that seems to wish that it would all just go away, and yet the train has come, and it's come as a result of the province. <clears throat> I want to show you 10 projects, if I can do this in an hour, that are really using this notion of intensification, projects that our office has done, as a way to further cultural and social and public space making in the city. I believe, um, and we talked about this earlier with George, that developers, I think it's a, it's a privilege to develop, not a right. And I think that developers and development community ought to give back in exchange for tremendous grants in density and height that go to supporting their business propositions. But the final thing I want to say just before I begin <clears throat> is that we also in our office do a somewhat curious, unusual thing. We love to collaborate with other design architects. This is not a usual phenomenon. Most design architects are fiercely competitive. 
And the normal relationship is a design architect and an executive architect. So a lot of the projects I'm going to show you are in collaboration with others. And I find, and I'm, <clears throat> I have a good friend, Stefan Banish, and I'll show you a building we did a number of years ago at U of T. And he and I got together recently um, over dinner, and, and we both said, you know, the building that we did at U of T is not a building that either office would have done independent of the other, but one that is somehow different and one that we both thought was probably one of the best works that's come out of either office. And I, th I think there's something in that, and um, I'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> I want to start with a couple of just really quick facts. This is what the plan anticipates, 3.7 million people in Ontario in the next 25 years at 60,000 units a year. Toronto, which is one of the principal growth centers, is to, meant to receive a thousand or a million people, which represents a construction of 16,000 units per year. And that's more or less what's going on in Toronto right now. The average total housing starts in Ontario in the last 10 or 15 years is about 40,000 units. So when the, the popular press tell you that this is a phenomenon, the condominium phenomenon in Toronto is unsustainable and, and it's, a, it's a bubble uh, waiting to, to burst is simply not true. What we're seeing is this, that in the year 2000, 28% of units <clears throat> constructed in Ontario were multi-unit, the rest largely suburban single tract housing. 10 years later, the year 2010, so we're five years into the plan, that number's inverted. So now 70% of multi-unit housing, or 70% of housing starts in Ontario are multi-unit housing. This is a, is a, a seminal sea shift in, in, uh, in what is going on, not only in Toronto, but in Ontario. Currently, in the city of Toronto, there are 328 development applications that represent over 40,000 units. 277 of these are in the, what they call the South District, which is really downtown, which is really where everyone wants to be. The official plan of Toronto tried to speculate and, and create a policy that 70% of the intensification would occur in the central core, in growth centers, the central core being the principal one, and 30% on arterials. Now, Jennifer Kiesmatt's going to be speaking here in a couple of weeks, I gather, and I, she may talk about this. The reality is about 95% of the development is in the central core and 5% on arterials because it's just not economically um, <clears throat> possible to develop good, marketable housing in Toronto on arterials in five to eight-story buildings. There were 100,000 units proposed in 2006 to 2010, and the city delivered about half of those. So it can't even keep up with its demand. This, I think, is an extraordinary fact. The city of Toronto's annual budget is $13.2 billion, which makes it the fifth largest province in Canada. Half of it is directed towards infrastructure, primarily plumbing. <clears throat> Sixteen percent is to the TTC, and yet there has been a fifty percent increase in TTC ridership in the downtown in the last five or six years as a result of this intensification. All of these projects I'm going to show you go through what's called a Section 37 development charge, which is you get a, a grant in density, in exchange you pay the city money. Last year, the city raised $60 million in development charges that are meant to go back into the public realm. Every year, there are about 15,000 units built in Toronto. They throw off an additional $45 million in property tax. That means every year. In 10 years, that's $450 million in additional revenue. And you think about, what I showed you the previous statistic, a $13 billion deficit, or, or, or budget, this is a significant number, and in yet, what goes back is zero. In other words, what the City of Toronto does every year <clears throat> is they amortize that additional $45 million and basically reduce the property taxes of all the taxpayers. So they don't even derive the benefit of this kind of increase in revenue, which leaves the city woefully short of money to maintain its infrastructure and its public, public realm. 
The average cost of a residential unit last year in Toronto, a uh, condominium unit rather, was 434000 in the central area. And the average cost of a single family house was 745000 So what's actually happening is that people can no longer afford to buy houses in downtown Toronto. The, my generation, Don's generation, we all bought houses, renovated them. That's almost impossible financially now for most people uh, graduating or in their late 20s, early 30s, and so they're buying condominiums. So this is a phenomenon that's extraordinary. The last thing I'll just say <clears throat> is that uh, during almost my entire professional practice, there had been less than a million square feet of office space built in Toronto. Uh, 12 million outside of Toronto, but less than a million in the downtown core, and office space is important to the vibrancy of any city, most particularly Toronto. In the last five years, there's been 5.8 million square feet constructed. Prior to that, the pundits would tell you the reason was that the cost of, of uh, taxes, commercial taxes in Toronto was so prohibitive that no developer would want to build and no tenants would want to, to, uh, to rent space. And in fact, what was happening was that the major office users were migrating out to the suburbs because that's where people were moving to. What's happening now is people are moving back downtown and those same employers, the big banks, the insurance companies, the law offices, are all starting to move back downtown. This is an amazing event. It's giving a vibrancy and energy to the city that it hasn't seen in a very, very long time. They are investing over, it's the biggest kept secret in Toronto, over a billion dollars in Union Station in the so-called big dig down. This is, an ex this is the largest public infrastructure project in Canada. And the Greater Toronto Transit Plan is an expenditure of $8.4 billion. So they're starting to gear up. Okay, so I'll get on to the projects. I'm already behind. This is a project we did about, this took 12 years to do, but this is an example of what I want to talk about. This is St. James Cathedral. St. James Cathedral, as a lot of churches are in the increased kind of secularization of our society, are trying to reinvent themselves. What do they do? St. James, most particularly, has developed a very robust outreach program for homeless people. It needed new facilities, a new parish hall. Uh, George was involved in his office uh, early on in this project. And what they did was they sold air rights, which was per permitted under the zoning bylaw, to a developer, Howard Cohen, to build the tower that you see in the background. In exchange, they got $5 million in the transference of their air rights on their property to kickstart this application. They then took them about another five or 10 years to fundraise to get another $5 million to get this project going. And essentially, what we did was use the, the, the development idea of, uh, or, or money from the, from the housing to really start to renew this institution. And without going and belaboring the architecture, we essentially reconstructed. This was a Darling and Pearson building from 1910. We totally took it apart, uh, rebuilt the parish hall. This, this project also has housing for the workers of the church. There's seven or eight units with the most amazing penthouse unit for the dean. It has administrative offices for the church on the second floor and a very beautiful parish hall on the main floor that they also use for weddings, funerals, other adjunct facilities. And it's really about trying to create a somewhat deprecating architecture to the original neo-Gothic architecture of the Darling and Pearson building, a very, very transparent building that really shows in many ways, both physically and metaphorically, what the church is trying to do in terms of its outreach program. Even the sun shades are glass. Projects like, this is interesting anecdote, the, the, the parish hall sits on a former graveyard. This was a graveyard in the cholera epidemic of Toronto in the 1800s. Uh, an extraordinary number of people were buried on this property. When they came to build the parish hall in 1910, they simply moved the graves within the footprint of the parish hall. They moved them up to St. James Cemetery up on, um, I guess, Parliament in Bloor. We were not allowed to excavate beyond the footprint of the parish hall because of there are still bodies buried there. 
And the church very much wanted a weather-protected link, and so the only thing we could do was actually span between the church and the parish hall with a cantilevered glass link with a heated uh, patio to allow that kind of linkage. You're right, I keep pointing at the screen. This is the dean's apartment, parish hall. Views back to the cathedral. The entrance into the parish hall. <clears throat> Four seasons. This is I interesting in the sense that this is a very, very different project. This is for the well healed and um, Izzy Sharp, who started the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, it's interesting to me that Canada, uh, which tends to be a fairly self-deprecating, modest culture, has the uh, distinction of having the most preeminent five-star hotel brand in the world. And uh, Izzy approached our client a number of years ago and said, look, we're, we are going to have to leave the Yorkville area. In a five-star hotel brand, our head office, our head, which is Toronto, we have a four-star hotel. Bloor Street itself, that whole precinct, was also in somewhat of a decline. Um, we, our office worked on the reconstruction of Bloor Street from Avenue Road to Church with the complete reconstruction of the street with granite sidewalks, new trees, lighting, and so forth. And that was actually an extraordinary project in which the BIA doubled the city's um, renewal budget for the street reconstruction to create something quite extraordinary. And <clears throat> Four Seasons was considering leaving the neighborhood. They needed to, to, to uh, tie into a developer that could help through a, a residential project, help to fund the construction of a new five-star hotel. And Kyle Ray, at the time who was the counselor, thought it would be terrible if, if uh, the hotel left this, this neighborhood. He thought it was a very important constituent element in the kind of the social um, character of, of the neighborhood. And so he, permitted this rezoning. This is an extraordinary building. It's uh, extraordinarily high, rather. It's 250 meters, one of the tallest buildings built in Toronto in a long time. And it's based on a very simple idea of creating a forecourt to the east of the tower in which Claude Cormier, landscape architect, did a somewhat um, witty landscape on the, on the play of, of, of Victorian Toronto in the creation of, of its landscape, and I'll show you that in a moment. And really a concentration of the density into a very tall hotel to the, to the left of the image and a second um, residential tower to the north and then what they call a public function block, which is all the back of house and ballrooms and so forth in the hotel. I liken this project, well, it, it really, first of all, it operates at two scales, at a metropolitan scale in terms of the skyline, and it has become somewhat of an icon in Toronto simply because of its location in the in the dearth of very tall buildings. And it really anchors and terminates Bay Street at its northern edge. But it also operates at the scale of the street. And in, in many ways, it's a very tough building. It comes down to the street in a very matter-of-fact way with a quite sort of tectonic stone cladding, series of Oreo windows, and really speaks to the notion of luxury and, and sequestered in, in hotels. I'll just leave it at that. And there's Claude Cormier's recreation of a Victorian fountain and his kind of witty reference back to Toronto and how serious it takes itself as a Victorian city. It's a project which was, um, again, residential intensification using that to fund the renewal of a public agency. In this case, it's the um, Children's Aid Society, they had a site downtown off Charles Street, a, a mid-block uh, property that went from Charles to the street to the south. They approached our client, and in exchange for rezoning the property and doing a very, very tall tower at the north end of the site, he rebuilt or built a brand new facility for them, the capital of which they would never have been able to fundraise for nor get from government sources. And what this created was a bit of a dilemma of a 45-story building on a, a site that is not much larger than the footprint of the tower and required and necessitated 
above grade parking, which for very good reasons Toronto uh, prohibits. And so our challenge here architecturally was to somehow mask that. And what we chose to do here was a four-story high lobby that really acts as a giant room on the street and a very beautiful lobby to the building. And um, you would never know that there's actually parking behind here. The city turned this project down in a rezoning. We actually <clears throat> had to have Kyle Ray overrule it at council because of this issue of parking. And in the end, I, I think it was a bit of a tempest in a teapot in the sense that I think it, it mediates very comfortably onto what has really become a, a very dense residential side street just south of Bloor Street. The roof of that garage is a beautiful outdoor amenity area, almost like a courtyard. Um, and I think it comfortably fits into this site in a very, very simple tower. What they're afraid of is this. And this is a project that's under construction by our respective offices, George and I, downtown Toronto. This is also above grade parking. And <clears throat> the problem with the city is that they will allow one thing because of what it gives back to the public realm or the social good. Developers then use it as a precedent and they simply take the physical construction and say, well, you did it there, why can't we do it here without any of the background? And this is what results. It's a project that I'm not actually allowed to show you, and I'm going to show you anyway. This is a competition for East Bayfront, Waterfront Toronto, and I sat on the design review panel for five years in Waterfront Toronto. It's actually an extraordinary agency. It's much maligned. It was given a billion and a half dollars of seed money to try to revitalize the waterfront. This is an enormous, enormous undertaking. And what they've chosen to do, and I think quite smartly, is to take that money, create strategic interventions within the public realm, um, Sherburne Park, uh, Queen's Quay, the Water's Edge Promenade, to try to create value in this neighborhood to then leverage their land asset, which is because most of the land is publicly owned south of Queen's Key, to be able to then vend that to a developer to then generate further revenue to continue to go. Uh, ultimately, they'll go around the corner in, into the port lands. And this is a very, very smart and thoughtful way, I think, to build a city. So this was the first competition coming out of that initiative. And just very quickly, and we did this um, with a consortium. We put, I put together a consortium of uh, Bruce Kurbar, KPMB, and Fritz von Dongen from Architect to Sea from Amsterdam. And if anyone knows contemporary housing, it's the Dutch. And we, this was a developer design competition. We came second. Um, but I think there were some very good ideas here that are transferable. And it starts with a very simple idea of Sherburne Park to the west, the Parliament Street slip to the east where, the, uh, I'm not sure, George, if they're still going to do this, but this very ambitious stormwater um, filtration system um, and a, a kind of a resultant crazy looking piece of public space on, on the surface of that. And the idea was to link these two as a, and create a, a shopping street our client was very keen on doing a mixed-use project, not just a residential condominium project. And the problem with Queen's Key is it's a very, very wide piece of infrastructure. It's 30 meters, 35 meters wide. It's very difficult to communicate from one side of the street to another in a vibrant retail um, street as we understand it in North America. And so the idea was to create a shopping street linking these two nodes to create a public space in the center and then to what we called interlacing land and water. This is a historic drawing of Toronto's waterfront with the keys. And in, introduce actually new keys back in. This is all landfill, but to recreate that notion of keys, which from a, from a real estate developer's perspective is a very smart move because what it does is it extends the frontage on the lake. But from our perspective, it was this kind of interlacement that we were quite attracted to. And then what we did, we developed our three offices, the plan together, 
And then we created this notion that we called coherent diversity, where we divided the blocks up, each office did two buildings, and we tried to have a bit of fun within this, within a larger idea of a coherent plan, and then tried to create some sense of architectural diversity, still deferring to the, to the, the basic principles of that plan. We started, we got a little carried away, we started creating metaphors for these buildings, started to name them, as you might name a boat, or an old country estate, and um, as I said, it was a lot of fun. This is what resulted. We, Ken Smith was uh, the landscape architect, public realm designer from New York, a very, very great designer. This is that shopping street. We submitted this uh, uh, competition about five days before Christmas, so we were getting a little bit carried away with, the, <laughs> I think, the Christmas spirit in this rendering. But this is a shot along the boardwalk of these, these buildings, as they say, coherent diversity. They're not built to any kind of datum, but some are leaning back, some are tipping forward, a sense of energy and, and uh, diversity that is, really comes from an, in Toronto, you see, and, and Toronto is no different than most North American cities where we've got this crazy kind of built form diversity, and so we're in many ways celebrating that. Office buildings along Queen's Key. Our client wanted to move into that one, the foreground. Pan Am. This is uh, the brave new world, if you've heard of it, of I.O. Infrastructure Ontario, where they, uh, more and more they will and have been asserting themselves that if you ultimately graduate here and become a practitioner, you're likely at some point in your career to be involved in an I.O. project. And that's both good and bad. It's a crazy process that's subject of another lecture, but Toronto is hosting the Pan Am Games in Toronto and the province was absolutely um, convinced that they did not want to replay or repeat the experience of Vancouver in, in the Athletes' Village in the Winter Olympics. Pan Am Games is four times the size of the Winter Olympics. It's 8,000 athletes, and so this is a serious undertaking. And so what the province in their wisdom said was, look, we're going to run an RFP to do a new residential neighborhood and what we're going to require is the developer to basically build a housing and lend it to us during the games and then we give it back to them. So this is a, actually a very fascinating process in which a sports venue is in part going to provide the catalyst for creating a neighborhood which is providing the housing for the sports uh, event. And um, so this project had a, what was called a precinct plan in place. The Waterfront Toronto worked on it for years created the street, street and block pattern. We had to absolutely adhere to all of those, that, that street and block pattern. We had to adhere. We could not extend one iota above the height datums on the blocks. And so we were, and architects hate to, to be this way, we were metaphorically and literally boxed in. We did this project with, uh, and again, we put together a team of um, Again, Bruce Kurbauer from KPMB, um, a crazy Mexican, um, Enrique Norton, 10 Architectos, um, Rene Dow of Dow, Lestage, and MJM uh, of Toronto, doing, there's actually a, a Y in here. <clears throat> so again, we, we developed this idea of coherent diversity, this notion of collaborative design. What's interesting about this project <clears throat> is that it sits at a very key point, uh, both physically and historically in Toronto. That is at the mouth of the Don, and there's been a lot of focus on the renaturalization of the Don, a lot of very good work, a lot of political rhetoric about it with the new mayor about trying to stop it, that it's, not, uh, it's too expensive, you know, on and on and on. This neighborhood really will potentially form the porthole into both the Don River and the Don Valley, which is an extraordinary re uh, resource in Toronto. And I grew up in Montreal. I was not really aware of the power of the ravines in Toronto until I started going down in them. They're almost like reverse mountains. That they're below 
you know, visually your plane of view, and yet there are these extraordinary places, and this neighborhood will become that one of the portals into that, as I said. It's also at the nexus of the connection to the waterfront revitalization. and also determination of Front Street. And so the idea here is to use Front Street as a catalyst to make connections physically and in terms of land use back to the downtown, because this is a very remote neighborhood. I'm gonna start to go very quickly here, um, because I think I'm gonna start to drag. So there's a whole series of ideas about courtyard housing, using those courtyards as another component of public space in conjunction with laneways to create pathways through this neighborhood and this community, much as you create, you see now in, in the historic laneways of Toronto, but to then take those laneways right into these courtyards and create a kind of a different level and quality of, of, of public space. So I'll just show you quickly two buildings that our offices did. <clears throat> the final plan. One is on the top left-hand corner. It's a new residence for George Brown with a YMCA at its base. There in the bottom left-hand corner. And it's really to be the gatepost. There's, there are only two buildings left of this precinct. The Canary Restaurant. This was actually, at the turn of the century, quite a vibrant industrial residential neighborhood and it completely got wiped out. So this is a very simple idea of setting the mass of the building, that this being the George Brown residence, to the back to allow that historical artifact in the foreground to be legible. These dissolves are painfully slow. Um, and that's the kind of the notional gatepost into this community. Okay. Now we start speaking really slowly. This is not. Wow, I'm sorry for this. <laughs> and then the courtyard housing, which is really about trying to carry a very public edge at the base, in this case, townhouses and residential on the side streets and, and retail on, on Front Street. This notion of sheared volumes to break down the scale of the buildings, to give a more of a sense of individuality and expression in the building to the, the people who will live there. <clears throat> and then to use these courtyards as a form of both actually front, front yards and front doors to units that face onto the corridor and a connection into those laneways so that you could actually transit from one block to another through these courtyards. And another slow pan. Front Street. I apologize. I've copied this from another presentation that was... Wow. They really wanted you to focus on this. This is why I should have had my computer up here. I could advance. I'm at the mercy of your projector. This is Enrique Norton's building in the bottom left-hand corner, the crazy Mexican. It's actually a pretty interesting project. I'm just going to talk about this very briefly. It's the National Ballet School. Um, a client of ours, Howard Cohen, also bought, this was the former CBC Broadcasting Center. Um, and our client bought this about eight or nine years ago and it was a public auction. And what's complicated about the project is that it, uh, the site is that it had on one street, this being Jarvis Street, Branksome Hall, the original Branksome Hall, and the, uh, kind of a two-story historic house that was, uh, the, one of the premiers of Ontario, and then the broadcast studios on the other side. And we 
Howard was in love with Branksom Hall. He thought you could rehab that building into a very snappy set of residences. And we had our first meeting with our neighbor, which was the National Ballet School, and they told us that uh, Jean Chrétien was a prime minister at the time, and his wife was on the board of directors of the ballet school. And they said, um, over our dead body, will you be allowed to actually close on this land? This is our land. We're, this is federally owned land. Chrétien promised this to us, and we're going to fight you on this and fight you in the zoning. And Howard was uh, understandably pretty upset. And I said to Howard after the meeting, you know, he was outraged, literally outraged. I said, maybe we could take advantage of this. Maybe what we could do is create a proposition in which you take half the property, you grant the other half of the property to the ballet school, and exchange what you'll get is higher height, that is more marketable from your perspective, and you will get um, the, the potential integration of, a, a, of the ballet school, and you could create this amazing complex uh, project. And that's, in, in fact, exactly what ensued. Initially, they didn't want Branksome Hall. They wanted the property to the north. We're looking north here. Uh, they thought they didn't also know what to do with Branksome Hall. Um, I said, well, that was a former school. And what the ballet school is is actually I'll just show this Branksome Hall to the south, is it's actually a school from um, kindergarten to grade uh, 11 or 12. And so that's really the, a school program that they run and then they teach uh, kids to dance. And so I think this is one of these amazing moments where you take a developer's desire to earn money, build a project, and a, a public agency or public institution that needs help financially, and you can actually work this together to create something truly extraordinary. None of this comes from the city. This is all about us working with developers trying to figure out how to do this. This we didn't do. We, we, we did the building, but this is an amazing project, Regent Park. Regent Park is um, an incredible initiative in Toronto. It is basically re imagining social housing projects. And it's a very, very brave project in which they're taking 3,500 units, they're totally demolishing them and putting back 2,000 units of public housing and another 3,000 units or 4,000 units of market housing. And the idea is to intermix uh, disadvantaged people with middle class people and try and create a new vibrant community, something that's an amalgam of the city. And this was the first project uh, we won by competition to kick off this, and I was very dismayed they wanted to do a tower, because what I was really, we'd done, we've got towers coming out our ears, and I wanted to do low-rise housing, and what Regent Park wanted to, they said, look, this is a, there's a co-generation uh, central utility in this building that's going to feed the power for the entire community, and what they needed was a tower to actually act as a smokestack to carry the exhausts up to a certain level. And so we were lining, essentially, that smokestack with housing. This is a very simple project. It, it consists of seniors housing in the pink and family housing in the kind of the green. And uh, seniors need, as we came to learn, uh, much more security. They needed to be a little bit off the street, and they wanted family housing down at the street. And so that's really what we created here. Excuse me. We were also trying to create a notion of fabric housing, something that was not a building that is very iconic, that it's a look at me building, but something that is grounded in very simple details, very simple materials that will age well and will point the direction, hopefully, for the rest of this community as it develops. at grade townhousing for families. I think the greatest tribute that was ever paid to our office was um, the first family that moved in. There was a young daughter, and she opened the door to her apartment. And we applied everything we learned in market condominiums in this project, trying to create great housing. 
and uh, had to do battle with the TCHC space standards and these crazy things with enclosed kitchens and so forth. But she opened the door and she said to her parents, uh, mom and dad, this is sick. This looks like a condo. University of Toronto, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting university. It's a, obviously, it's a downtown campus. It's knit into the grid of the city, and it's running out of land, quite literally. And it had identified about 10 years ago, I think it was 26 sites that were uh, vestigial sites of, uh, uh, that they, they could imagine developing on. They put a plan in place on each one of these sites, worked with the city, had a selection for a new biosciences building, this was the site. It's the remnant Tattle Creek Road, which was terminated. It runs north off college, and it was terminated with the medical sciences building to the north. Um, and it, I couldn't believe when we went to the first um, RFP kickoff meeting, and this was the site. I mean, it's, it's a road. And uh, they had created a plan in which the building was set back off between the Roseboro Building and Fitzgerald Building, which are these two quite handsome historical buildings that bookend the site. And then it kind of hepped up and was built on top of the Medical Sciences Building. And so what we chose to do, and the problem with biosciences buildings is they're high secure facilities. There's an animal testing facility in the basement of this building. We, Stefan Banish, I did this project, our office with uh, Stefan Banish from Stuttgart. He called it Tora Bora, because at the time they were looking for uh, that uh, fellow from uh, Al-Qaeda in, in uh, Afghanistan. It's a rabbit warren of literally and figuratively of rooms. And then the labs above. And yet this site is an important connector from College Street into King's College Circle going northward through medical sciences. And so we wanted to, to maintain that path. So we literally lifted up the building and created a, a very sense, high sense of public space at the base of this building, so you're not really aware of what's going on above or below in terms of the sensitivity of security. We also pushed the build, we brought it forward and we pushed it to one side, so that we created a space, a landscape space adjacent between this building and the building to the west in a way that um, then made some sense of the vestigial space to the east of this building. It remains as, a, as an outdoor space, as opposed to just setting this thing in the middle and having um, kind of very uncomfortable spaces on both sides. So this is all on the ground floor, and that's the section of how we did it. So we just pushed the building to the west. One of the problems with academic buildings generally, and most particularly with uh, science buildings, is in labs, is that people tend to sequester themselves within those labs and you lose the cross-communication and cross-fertilization that you get in education, you get in research. And so and this really came from Stefan's office, this notion of vertical connectivity, creating stairs throughout the building. Because when you're on a floor that's accessed by an elevator, you tend to see yourself isolated on that floor. You're not really aware of what's above you and below you. So this was an idea to use this vertical space to get students and researchers out and start to communicate. This notion of gardens that are placed within the building that connect two and three floors so that when students come out of the labs to take a break, they can actually meet other students from a floor above or a floor below. A very, very simple idea. Using a double facade that Stefan didn't want to use, but I was totally intrigued with these European double facades. And uh, it's one of those garden spaces. This doesn't have a lot to do with intensification in Toronto. I'm just going to show it to you, and then I'm going to finish on one project. This is Brock University. This is a project we just finished, and I'm quite proud of it, so I just wanted to show it. But it's, um, it's interesting to me that most universities that have, were developed in Ontario after the Second World War follow a similar pattern, and, and Waterloo is no different. That is a perimeter ring road with uh, 
a bunch of disparate buildings, almost like raisins within a bun in the center, parking at the perimeter. And, and Brock, the master plan for uh, Brock was done by Raymond Moriyama's office, and I, 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 I highly respect a big fan of Raymond Moriyama. I don't think this was his best work. And what it really looks like when you come to Brock is a shopping center. If you didn't know better, you'd say there's a sea of parking lots and buildings that are all linked together with a lack of coherence about anything. And they have a new president, and the new president said what we need is a new plan. They hired urban strategies, they created a new plan, a grid of streets essentially cut through the, through the campus to create greater permeability into the campus. You can actually drive into it, you can actually walk into it. And this is supposed to be the first building at the kind of the new front face of Brock. And it's also an important facility for Brock because it's, it's, a, it's a $120 million research center, which is uh, extraordinary in the Niagara region. So it has a two-story lab lock building on the, on the upper two floors, very simple idea with a, a greenhouse. And then the bottom two floors are more of a typical academic program. There's an adjunct. Uh, facility from McMaster here and so we wanted to try and articulate those facilities as different from the lab block. Architects love this idea of uh, a programmatic description within their massing. You approach the building and really the new entrance to Brock University at the eastern end of this building and what we created here were essentially two large living rooms at the base of the building where students can enter the building and you go through this building to the balance of the university and, and Brock has this very curious almost plus 15 concept where a piano noble concept where the principal circulation floor that links all the buildings is up on the second floor hence the bridge to the right of the screen and then the lab block floor where we couldn't quite do what we did at CCBR in terms of interspersing those gardens throughout the labs what we chose to aggregate one large area at the end of that lab block so that, again, students and researchers can come out of their labs and kind of recreate in the end of this block. So this is as you enter the building. Very, very simple, in many ways, very straightforward building. We had to do this on a sequentially tendered fast track project basis. So if, if ever you work on this or someone suggests that might be a good idea, run. It uh, puts architects under a tremendous pressure. They're building it while we're designing it. So this is, there's a circulation spine that runs. This is a very, very long building. It's 450 feet. The circulation spine then connects and goes up a stair into the balance of the campus. Again, allows the second and main floor to start to communicate, very simple idea. A bridge linking back to the balance of the campus. Using exit stairs as also a communication device that's visible. In this case, this red stair here that leads up. And then bifurcating the building in a north-south direction between these programmatic blocks so that you start to create also porosity and communication through the building in the other direction. So I'm going to end on this project. This is also a project that I'm not supposed to show you. This is a competition for the Gardner Expressway. We did this project with uh, Walter Hood, a landscape architect from San Francisco, and Diller Scafidio Renfrew from New York, Charles Renfrew. And um, the competition, it was a very intriguing competition. What Waterfront Toronto said was, look, we're going to break the competition into three teams. Two, or three streams, rather, two teams in each stream. So the first stream is, and we were on this, you, you keep the gardener in place. Second team is there's a partial dismantlement of the gardener, and the third team is take it right down. So we were on the keep it in place, and I'm actually a big fan of the Gardner Expressway, it's as strange as that sounds, because I think it has the potential of being an incubator for Toronto. Uh, I don't know, any of you have been to Berlin, where 
or Paris or even the 59th Street Bridge in New York where they start to inhabit underneath these pieces of infrastructure that become these ribbons that run through the city that can actually be quite extraordinary things. So we looked at this and we thought the problems were this. Um, under, over, and beside the Gardner, these are the issues. Through the rail berm to the north of Gardner, in fact, that is a greater physical impediment to connectivity of the city from the north down to the waterfront. What we call the Gordian Knot, which is the confluence of the Gardner and Lakeshore Boulevard and the channelization of the Don River where it all becomes completely confused and I would call the failed promise of the Grand uh, Boulevard to the east, which is the runoff of the Gardner, where they took it down about five years ago and promised us a Grand Boulevard. So the Gardner, it can be conceived of or thought of both on top. Most people think of the Gardner from below, and that, that is a horrible thing. But it's also important to consider it at the top, underneath, and we believed that the real issue, and still believe, the real issue of underneath the Gardner is Lakeshore Boulevard. It's not the fact of this physical construction. In fact, it's quite permeable visually looking north and south. It's that it's such a horrible condition under there with an eight-lane expressway. And beside, with the rundown ramps that really create a problem with physical connectivity north-south. The rail berm, which is what it is, a giant berm that's impenetrable other than at a few north-south arterial streets and this is what you see this is Cherry Street this is a frightening condition the Gordian Knot this crazy confluence of all sorts of things happening here which actually could be an extraordinary space but you look at it today and you wonder how could you ever make anything of that A friend of mine tried to take his boat up here one day. And as I call it, the failed promise of the Grand Boulevard. This is what we got, the takedown of the Gardner. You put traffic engineers in charge of this and this is what you get. You get big box retail, um, re trees that die are not nurtured in a horrible, horrible condition. So we looked at this as four precincts. We started and we, we analyzed it on, and I'll just touch briefly on a few of these, but these six kind of fundamental preoccupations. The first being a green artery. We thought, why could not the top of the garden get green? China does this on their elevated expressways, that you could actually literally, figuratively green the gardener. It's a beautiful road to drive on, and there's nothing wrong with that to use the gardener as an urban incubator, that we could actually start to seed it with uses that could then start to create not only connectivity north and south um, or, or underneath it, but also north and south and adjacencies. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. This notion of cross-stitch, that actually you can go av above it, below it, to really knit it into the fabric of the city, wheels and feet, the whole focus has been on railways and cars, and more laterally, I call them the bike Nazis. They're almost as bad as the car advocates and the train advocates, but the, but, but the pedestrian has been forgotten, and to try to develop some coherent idea in which all four of those modes can coexist. So we start with this area, the first area. This notion, it's a bit fantastical, but the idea that you could actually grow trees on the gardener. That you could take, and they are going, they, there is a plan to do this, to take down some of these off-ramps, slide Lakeshore Boulevard out from underneath the gardener, so that you could start to create a clear shot of Lakeshore, not, only, not as, a, as a collector highway for the gardener, but as an almost local road that starts to, to reanimate and redevelop this section of Toronto. So that sectionally you could create this notion of building under the gardener with buildings, constructions, that then start to front onto this new lakeshore to the south of the gardener, and then construction to the south of that. 
to maybe theme this in terms of different uses, this notion of cross-stitching, that there's also permeability within the blocks north and south, that you get, get these crazy kind of pavilions that become quite interesting. So that this could become this, this could become this, this, how we could open up at the berm. So this could become this by cutting portals for light between the tracks, lining those bridges with uses on either side, whether the retail or someone had an idea about a big LCBO store. <laughs> Building on top, actually creating physical constructions over the railway berm. And this is most I think uh, warranted in the distillery, in the extension of Mill Street, over into the south. This is actually possible. So this could become this. That you start to create this kind of delirious city. The notion of using towers, uh, not at the, at the heads of the main arterials as the waterfront plan imagines, but as local towers that, that kind of terminate the local north-south streets, almost like green shoots, green incubators that can start to create a sense of identity locally within a particular precinct and block. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to go fast. I saw this in Berlin under, and I, George may knows, maybe knows this, I, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's an elevated tramway in Berlin, and it has these amazing art galleries and stores and bookstores and things underneath this piece of linear uh, uh, infrastructure, and in, in our idea, that's what we could do in Toronto. So this could become this. The second section to the east was to create this kind of crazy high density precinct of commercial and residential development. Basically to create another node a little bit out of the downtown to try and create a focus for this section of Toronto. A set of buildings that, if the traffic engineers would let us, you could actually span over the Gardner Expressway and then create this amazing driving experience. The Dutch do this. They use buildings um, as linkages across expressways. So they'll build an office building and that will create a physical linkage from one side of an expressway to another. And I think it's a very, very clever idea. And that's what we were proposing here. So then you start to create another node, another commercial node. There's actually a, a planned GO train stop here from a transportation infrastructure it could actually work and take some relief off Union Station, which is becoming amazingly congested. The third was the area around the Gordian Knot where we imagined some kind of hyper Amsterdam where you would create canals to really celebrate in this interlacement of water that we kind of experimented with with the, with the Bayside competition, bring Lake Ontario into here and create a high density residential neighborhood that interweaves the gardener and the lake and housing. And finally, the Grand Boulevard. So Walter Hood had this amazing idea of taking this runoff of Lakeshore Boulevard and using it as a, an incubator and arboretum or whatever the proper term is for trees, a tree nursery essentially. The Chinese and the Dutch do this on their highway corridors. They actually plant trees. And then they use those trees when they're matured to a certain um, extent, then they transplant them into the city and into their parks. So it's a, this kind of linear tree farm. So the notion is that you could create this linear tree farm <coughs> that could start to green both the gardener, 
and also the adjacent neighborhoods. And he had this whole idea of bioswales and stormwater that would take hours to explain, but it's a pretty interesting idea, so that it could actually start to then green the port lands and the, and the neighborhoods, the industrial neighborhoods to the north. So I'm just going to end on this little video. Two. So, if anyone asks you if you've ever seen this, just deny it. <laughs> Thanks.